For the second part of this talk, we want to consider electrolytes. But before we do that, we need to understand a little bit of the basic science behind this. And we need to look at atoms and ions. Atoms and ions. Now, an atom is the building block of matter. It's a single unit of matter. And an element is a substance made up of only one type of element, only one particular substance, as opposed to a compound, which is a chemical combination of two or more elements. So elements are chemicals that can't be broken down into simpler chemicals. Now, 99% of living tissue is made up of only six elements, actually. There's carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, sulfur, and potassium. This is the stuff of living tissue. Now all the elements have symbols that represent them. So C means carbon, N means nitrogen, H means hydrogen, O means oxygen, P is phosphorus, S is sulphur. Well, that was quite easy, wasn't it? They're all the English letters. But sometimes it's a bit confusing because the letter is taken from the Latin, uh, the Latin term. And K is the chemical symbol for potassium. Atoms are composed of three types of subatomic particles. There's three building blocks to the atom. In the nucleus, in the centre of the atom, there are neutrons and protons. Circulating round about the neutrons and protons, round about the nucleus of the atom, there are electrons. And it's important to understand the charges that these particles have, because these particles have electrical charges. They are electrically charged particles. Neutrons are neutral, they have no electrical charge. Protons have one positive charge, electrons have one negative charge. So protons positive, electrons negative, neutrons neutral, they have no charge. Now the simplest atom is a hydrogen atom. This contains of one, this can, consists of one central proton, so the nucleus only contains one proton really. And then circulating round about that, there is a single electron. So the hydrogen atom, one proton and one electron. Now in the nucleus of the carbon atom, there's neutrons, I think there's six neutrons, but in addition to that, there's six protons. So in a carbon atom, there's six protons. And round about that, there are uh, six electrons orbiting about. So there's six electrons orbiting round about the nucleus containing the six protons. So if we look at these atoms, we've considered that there's one positive charge there and one negative charge there. So there's a positive charge and a negative charge. And I think you can see because there's one positive and one negative, they balance each other out. So the atom is neutral. And this is always the case. An atom is electrically neutral. In the case of the carbon, there's six protons surrounded by six electrons. So again, you've got six positive charges, six negative charges, so the overall charge again is neutral. In the case of oxygen, well oxygen contains eight protons in the nucleus, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and then round about that there are circulating eight electrons, two close in and there's actually three, four, five, six, 
another six circulating further out. Sorry, they should be going in the same direction, really. Let's make them go in the same direction. Doesn't matter too much. The point is that there are eight protons, so there's eight positive charges. There's eight electrons, so there's eight negative charges. So again, the overall atom is neutral. One more example, nitrogen, very common element in, in biological systems. Seven protons in the nucleus and seven electrons orbiting round about that. So again, seven positives, seven negatives. Overall, the atom is electrically neutral. So an atom is an electrically neutral particle. However, an ion is a charged particle, a charged atom if you like, although it ceases to be an atom because by definition atoms are neutral and ions are charged. So an ion contains a negative charge or a positive charge or two negative charges or two positive charges. It's a charged, it's a charged particle. And the reason is that in an ion there is an unequal number of electrons and protons. An unequal number of electrons and protons. Whereas in an atom, there's an equal number to make it electrically neutral. So, for example, let's think about a sodium atom. A sodium atom contains 11 protons and 11 electrons, therefore it is electrically neutral. Let's, let's draw one. 11 protons and 11... Sorry, I said 11 neutrons, I meant 11 electrons. 11 protons and 11 electrons. So, a sodium atom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, there's eleven protons in the nucleus, and surrounding that, there is eleven electrons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So, we've got plus 11 protons, 11 positive charges. We've got minus 11 negative charges. Overall, that gives us a neutral uh, atom. However, if this ionizes, if it changes into an ion, then what happens in the case of sodium is that we lose one of these um, electrons. It loses an electron. So that electron is no longer there. Cross it out. So now we've still got 11 protons, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So we've still got plus 11, but we've lost an electron, so now we've only got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, minus 10 uh, negative charges from the electrons. So that means that now overall we have a plus 1 positive charge. And that's what happens when sodium ionizes. It becomes not Na, which is the symbol for sodium. It becomes Na+. It now carries a positive charge. Potassium contains 19 protons in the nucleus and 19 electrons round about it in the atomic form when it's an atom. But when it's an ion, it loses an electron, it goes down to 18 electrons with 19 protons, therefore it also has a positive charge of K plus, one positive charge. Calcium atom has uh, 20 protons, 20 electrons. When that ionizes, it loses two electrons, so it becomes Ca2 plus. Chlorine normally contains 17 protons and 17 electrons. That actually gains an electron. So because it gains an electron, it becomes negative. When it's ionized, it has 18 electrons. That means it's got one electron more than it has protons. Therefore, it has an overall negative charge.
So an ion is a charged particle, it has a negative or a positive charge. Now an electrolyte is a substance that will release ions when dissolved in water. But actual fact in practice, we tend to talk about the individual ions as electrolytes. So for example, NaCl, that is simple salt, sodium chloride, when it's dissolved in water, the atoms of the molecule split. As they split, they ionize. The sodium becomes positive because it loses an electron. The chlorine becomes negative, becoming a chloride ion, because it gains an electron. KCl is potassium chloride, ionizes into a K plus and a Cl minus. Calcium chloride, CaCl2, becomes Ca2 pluses, because remember calcium loses two electrons. And the, you get two ions of Cl minus, two negative chloride ions produced as it dissolves. So any substance which will produce ions when dissolved in water, we decide as an electrolyte. In clinical practice, though, very often we talk about the sodium, the potassium, and the calcium themselves actually as the electrolytes. There's a few other ions you may come across. Magnesium, Mg, Mg plus 2. Carbonate, CO3 minus. Phosphate, PO4 minus 3. And sulfate, SO4 minus 2. OK, why am I teaching you all about this science at the moment? Well, the answer is that we need to understand this because electrolytes are essential to life. Remember, maybe from other talks, we looked at cells. For example, this could be a cell in the myocardium or it could be a nerve cell. Normally, they're negative on the inside and positive on the outside. This electrical potential difference is made up because there are more negative ions on the inside than there are positive ions on the outside. So it's the distribution of ions which generates the electrical charge across nerve cell membranes and muscle cell membranes. For a muscle to contract, there must be a depolarization, and the cell will change to being positive on the inside and negative on the outside. If this does not happen, then the, uh, the cell, the muscle cell will not contract. So this state is described as being polarized. This is depolarized. This process of depolarization. Right, and then depolarization. So when the cell is polarized, it changes to being depolarized via the process of depolarization, and it's the depolarization that makes it contract. After it's depolarized, it will repolarize, of course. So it's essential that we have the right amount of electrolytes in the body so that excitable cells such as nerves and muscles can maintain a potential electrical difference across their cell membranes. Therefore, nerve impulses can be transmitted and muscles can be stimulated to contract. If the balance of the electrolytes is not right, then the nervous system will not work properly and the muscles will not work properly. And the muscle that is normally affected first, the tissue which is normally affected first, is the myocardium. So electrolyte balance is essential to maintain normal cardiac function. That is why it is so important.